Rather, I am thinking of the tomfoolery which instantiates within human cognition a framing of the diversity in human morphology that presumes particular differences in melanin and physique as somehow being something more than biological, adaptive biological change to material condition. Such an absurdity is the idea of race. I class race as an absurdity because of the idea's resilience in the face of exhaustive biological, sociological, and historical inquiry, which demonstrates that the very idea, while perhaps one of the most materially effective in the last half millennia, has absolutely no founding in anything save the rationalizing machinations of the human imagination. So then, the particular absurdity of race is that far from signifying anything that is scientifically demonstrable, it constellates itself again and again in the contradistinction to that which is scientifically demonstrable. Here I am saying that it is something more than simply a surd, and surd recall is the thing which defies the rational. It is something more powerful than the rational. Its overpowering of the rational is made possible by the dimension of its existence related to the transpersonal. By this I mean that race cannot be located in any one dimension of human existence. It operates in the existential space that Tillich identifies as the depth of human existence. Meaning it joins the aesthetic the material and cultural into a sort of sense-making apparatus. I find Tillich a helpful resource for the theorization of race because his notion of the depth of human existence exposes the mischaracterization of race as a cultural notion which benignly describes human diversity and may or may not be appropriated in ways that fund social and material relations, which is how we would describe racism. Rather, I want to contend that the category itself becomes a founding moment in the creation of these malformed relations, and that it does so by implicating itself in every dimension of human existence as being a presumptive truth of human beings. So put another way, we presume that it tells us something about what it means to be human. In this way, race is a religious discourse and not a discourse of cultural, um, uh, or, and not a discourse or a cultural element of some already preformed discourse gone awry. By religious discourse, I mean an epistemological matrix which provides symbolic opportunities, linguistic and physical, to engage the deepest meaning of human existence, or as Tillich might suggest, the depth of every dimension of human existence, which parenthetically is why no one mode of interrogation is sufficient to the task of giving an account of race or explaining its continuing grip on the human imagination in modernity. Situating race as a religious discourse and not simply locating it in the midst of other cultural discourses, as many theorists are wont to do, allows us to get at not only the persistence of a continually refuted idea, but also allows us to understand why it is that seemingly rational people and peoples will actively invest their whole selves and live in ways that are patently irrational and easily demonstrated to be evil. They do so because race as a discourse invites reception as a category of ultimacy. It is just this character of ultimacy that leads to my assessment of race as being a religious discourse. In doing so, I'm resisting the common inclination to make race simply an artifact of malformed material relations, 
which produces through time. It is that, but it is also much more. It is my sense that such <clears throat> reductions occlude an understanding of the operation of race as a category that has to do with ultimacy. I note here that while not always a hegemonic discourse, race nonetheless reinforces hegemonic and demonic structures which do rely on the acceptance of it as a discourse that expresses something true about reality. By making the claim that race is best interpreted as a religious discourse, I am seeking to locate reflection on the category in the realm of faith. More specifically, I am arguing that the persistence of the category in modernity has to do with its capacity to become a site of ultimate meaning and a site of ultimate meaning making by constructing and reconstructing itself trans-historically, trans-globally, utilizing the characteristics of blood, soil, and culture. Identifying race as a site of ultimate meaning necessarily suggests that we are involved with the workings, then, of faith. Such a move that interprets racism as a creature of faith, the faith that I'm talking about here, a perennially reconstructed pattern of faithful living which finds its ground in existential alienation. There are more than significant photos of the gleeful faces of good citizens standing below the bodies of burned and hanging people who have been lynched. And there is even a famous case in Kentucky of people who left a camp meeting to engage in a lynching and then went back to worship after. There are several ways that the idea of faith can be approached in relation to the category of race. The first might be to recuperate Tillich's most commonly used definition the state of being ultimately concerned, by which he means the investment of oneself fully into some object of faith. Now, using this definition, faith is not simply the mundane ascent to an idea or the placing of trust in a person or institution, as the word is most often used. It is the investment of one's mind, spirit, and body into some object of devotion. It is the investment of the total self. This investment of the self is an inescapable dimension of human existence for two reasons. First, humanity experiences existence not so much as it ought to be or should be, but simply rather as it is. Frequently, the gap between what ought to be and what is creates a perennial condition of anxiety and estrangement. The anxiety emerges from the prominent feature of human existence, namely that in spite of our capacity to transcend the bounds of our finite existence, we are nonetheless fated to the end of all that is finite, non-being. To put it plainly, we move through existence with the sure knowledge that just as there was a time when we were not, there will be a time when we are no more. This encounter with non-being has the capacity to annihilate what meaning there is to be found in our existence with the consequence that we become estranged from the very goodness that is our existence. What then is created as the inescapable dimension of human existence is a yearning for something to fill the vacuous space created within us by this annihilation of meaning. It is this yearning which might be said to be the basis of faith that seeks an object. On Tillich's read, this is the depth or religious dimension of human existence. A second way that we might define faith, using Tillich's categories, is as being the site of revelation that makes sense of the vicissitudes of human existence. Where the first definition is concerned with the holistic center around which a self might be integrated, 
This construal of faith is more concerned with the epistemological and more particularly the moral when it is understood to be the right orientation of life based on a right understanding of the divine and our relationship to it. By claiming the second rendering as an epistemological category, I am flagging that dimension of faith that has to do with the unseen reality which is expresses itself through material forms. And this is where Tillich begins to talk about religion. Now it should be apparent that neither of these definitions of faith is sufficient without the other, for no faith can be real without material expression or a material reference. Likewise, no religion can be said to have to do with faith, using Tillich's approach to the idea, if it does not create a site at which its devotees can enter into encounter with that which they can devote their whole selves. It is my sense that race operates more in this second rendering of faith with, the significant, with significant implications for the first. My particular demarcation of race is predicated on the presumed capacity of the category to provide knowledge about the deep things of human existence. Namely, why are people the way they are? Why, if we are all the same at some basic level, are we demonstrably different from one another? How do these differences factor into the divine economy of things? These questions are clearly not limited to modernity. The myth of the Tower of Babel attest to the antiquity of these questions. But it is yet true that race is one discourse which seeks to answer these questions. And it is important to see that in providing an answer, what is presumed of it, and when I say it, what is presumed of race, is a knowledge which is historically rooted, contemporaneously expressed in materiality, and inescapably shaping of the future. In this regard, the category of race operates something like an ontology. Not an ontology of being, but rather an ontology of the material, or more precisely, the social. To get at the idea of race as a social ontology, let me first look at what is, I believe, meant by the concept of ontology. While there are certainly complex definitions that can be provided for this concept, for our purposes, a working definition might be this. An ontology is a description of the structural character of a given reality as it exists. That is to say that it is an interpretation of the necessary nature of things for a given reality to exist as it does. Now generally this account then provides an organizing principle or set of principles for the particular system in which it has currency. A social ontology can then be understood as an interpretation of the necessary structure of a particular social configuration for it to have existence. When we look at the social as a phenomenon, it is the material and ideational site at which the ideas of peoplehood, nation, and culture intersect. And as, as I've suggested glancingly, those are the elements that we bring together into discourses of race. Now in his book, Good and Evil, Interpreting the Human Condition, Edward Farley offers a helpful way to think about the social. According to Farley, the social is the environment that is already present to shape individual agents and interpersonal relations as they come into existence, which is why we're saying it's an ontology, because it creates the world into which we come prior to anything that we do in that world. Accordingly, it constructs the concrete context or matrix of all agendas shapes all interpretations, and generates all discourses. We human beings know ourselves and our world only through 
an already formed sociality that contains institutions, languages, customs, and norms. So part of what I'm suggesting is that in our context, race creates a kind of ontology that contributes to the construction of all of these. So the social is therefore more than simply the physical or imaginative space that humans inhabit, which is the way that I think many conceive it. The social is, more importantly, the space in which the imagination imposes upon the material universe already thematized meanings and interpretations resulting in the creation of what we commonly call reality. Moreover, the social is the space within which interpretations of material reality continue to exist and signify contemporary existence. A way to think about the social is that it is the Rosetta Stone for viewing the past, the lexicon for interpreting the present, and a telescope for seeing the future. An implication of this understanding of the social is that if some imaginative construct becomes embedded within it, it gains the power to signify reality and all those who inhabit it, precisely because the social is all-encompassing this power of imaginative construction affects institutions, languages, customs, and norms. The effects of imaginative constructions in these areas are multiple. While this understanding of the significance of race and social ontology, with this understanding rather, of the social significance of race as social ontology, a few things become apparent. It becomes clear that with the construct of race, we have to do with something that structures the very way we receive and interpret the experience that we call reality. So, far from the simplistic interpretation that views racial identification as merely some statistical categorization, this interpretation understands race to structure the very ways that bodies and communities uh, they constitute are received and placed in the common sense that characterizes a society. By placed, I mean the way that humans are structured into given into a given social according to the morphology of the bodies which they exist. They are placed not only in the contemporary context, but also historically and proleptically. In theological terms, what I would want to suggest is that race becomes eschatologically significant, perhaps preeminently visible in the vast number of segregated graveyards throughout this nation. Now, the proceeding has been an attempt to offer a way of placing race as a religious discourse. I now turn to what I think is the more important issue at hand, and that is a reflection on its operation as religion. For this, I turn to Tillich's evocation of the demonic. Allow me to begin with what I understand to be Tillich's description of the demonic. The demonic is that dimension of the encounter with the holy, which has the capacity to draw the person to an investment of their whole self with the promise that this investment will yield fulfillment of the human yearning born of existential estrangement that characterizes human life. Because this invitation involves the person with some penultimate dimension of reality, whatever promise it may seem to have, the only sure thing is that it will, on the deepest level, involve persons with the structures of alienation and estrangement which characterize human existence. It is precisely this feature of the invitation which makes it demonic. Namely, 
that in the end it is finally destructive of the very self that it made the promise of integration to in the first place because it leads away from the encounter with the actual ultimate that provides the answer to the problem of estrangement. Another language to talk about this is idolatry. While frequently the demonic is made synonymous with idolatry, it is better understood as a misidentification of the holy and an inappropriate response of investing oneself based on that error. So then for Tillich, the demonic is yet a dimension of the holy, but ones whose power of fascination inexorably leads to destruction. In naming the demonic as a dimension of the encounter with the holy, Tillich is able to explain two dimensions of its reality that seemingly resist reason and to identify a way that it gains material form. The first is the power of the forces of the demonic examples are nationalisms, racisms, etc., to perennially seduce nations, peoples, and individuals by its siren call, even in the presence of the long history of these projects coming to naught. Human history is littered with the wreckage of nations and peoples who thought this time it will be different. We will be the thousand-year right we will be the nation that has God's favor forevermore. Yet, it always ends the same, in destruction. Precisely because the demonic contains within itself the mesmerizing power of the holy, through its capacity to create the experience of seeming wholeness and fulfillment beyond the bounds a finite existence, uh, for example, the superpersonhood or transhistorical promise of a nation, it is able to seduce in the face of demonstrable evidence that the seduction is lethal. How many empires have to fall before every new empire understands that empires finally have no future? On Tillich's account, this is because in the final analysis, the demonic destroys reason in favor of an ecstatic experience of a contrived unity. This unity revolves most often, uh, most often is grounded in some finite dimension of existence. Accomplished as well by locating the demonic as a dimension of the holy is the possibility to explain how it changes form through time, yet remains the same, at least in its material effect, uh, within reality in every circumstance. The changing yet consequentially the same character of the, the demonic has to do with the very nature of the holy, according to Tillich. The holy is the ground of ultimate and never-ending creativity in every time and situation. Tilt refers to this as a breaking through of the ecstatic that brings with it the encounter with the mystical power. Put another way, the experience of the holy dissolves even if only momentarily, the terrifying grip of finitude and its attendant anxiety. Because the experience of the holy is conditioned, though not limited, by the existential reality in which it is unfolded, the discrete character of the encounter with it changes from time to time, context to context. Yet, for Tillich, while contextually conditioned, the encounter with the holy is described as always being the same, grace breaking through the form while both acknowledging the form and acknowledging the unconditional form. That is to say, the holy is made known and experienced through the symbols and practices of meaning specific to cultures and context without claiming ultimacy for those symbols and practices. 
so that when the holy breaks forth, it breaks forth using the material symbols that are available in any given culture and in any given time. But it becomes an error to reduce it to those structures and to those symbols. It is just here that the demonic becomes manifest in the destructive power of what Tillich calls the sacred anti-divine where the holy as creative power expresses itself through symbols, always drawing those grasped by its power to richer encounter with the unconditioned God. The demonic draws those grasped by its power to a dissolution of themselves in the pedestrian shapes of specific cultures, whatever their spe specificity may be. Put simply, the holy and its shadow, the demonic, can and do express themselves in ways that refuse to be definitively located in one culture or context, yet their field of consequence is always the same, life and death. A third, though not final, intervention that is provided by the location of the demonic is in reflections on the holy is that Tillich is then able to bring attention to the demonization of cultural forms, both sacred and secular. He describes it thus, religions in the narrower sense are subject to the danger of what I call demonization, which occurs when particular symbols and ideas are absolutized and become idols unto themselves. Perfect example is the immigration debate that we're having today in our nation. There are some folk who prima facie can never be citizens simply because they didn't come across the Atlantic, rather they came across the Rio Grande. An example of this demonization is when particular forms and expressions of the Christian faith are presumed to bear within themselves salvific consequence. So when particular liturgical practices or ethnic appropriations of the faith become the object of the faith in and of themselves and cease to point to the God which they are supposed to create the possibility of our encounter with. Now in these instances of demonization, the symbols of the faith cease to function in their vocations as a mean to enable the experience of the transcendent reality of the ultimate beyond themselves and instead pre pretend to be the sumum bonum in themselves thus drawing devotion appropriate only for the ultimate to themselves, these demonized symbols and practices are a way that mesmerization by the demonic is mistaken for being grasped by the holy. An image that comes to mind uh, with which Tilt would have been well acquainted is that of the Nuremberg Rally of 1933. Now before turning to an interpretation of the demonic as it might be applied heuristically to the category of race, let me provide a summary of its functioning in relation to the holy. I have suggested that Tillich's identification of the demonic as being a dimension of the holy gives us helpful insights for understanding, one, why the demonic seemingly persists throughout human history despite the clear evidence of its inexorably lethal results for nations, people, and individuals. Two, how it changes form, yet remains largely the same in terms of its consequence. And three, how the demonization of cultural forms connected to the sacred are its modes of transmission. Admittedly, the brevity of my count begs expansion, but that's for another time. Here it is enough to identify the three dimensions of Tillich's theological discourse of the demonic that I think are most helpful for a theological understanding of the category of race. There are three features of race as it functioned in modernity 
that bear a stark resemblance to what I've unfolded as dimensions of the uh, demonic. Perhaps the most important is its persistence as a meaning-making category which is presumed to have revelatory power in relation to persons and communities. This persistence is clearly in spite of multiple demonstrations of the falsity of its fictive account of human history and diversity. More than just a meaning-making category, race has held the power to enliven mass movements motivate entire political and legal regimes, and to brutalize whole civilizations to willingly descend into genocidal madness. As well, the penchant for the category itself to not only persist, but to find meaningful ways of expression in different historical, cultural, and geographic locations while yet leading to expected results in virtually every circumstance, alienation and material suffering. These two workings of race are uniformly facilitated by the inscription of the category on the symbolic universe of sacred space and practice, which mediate the holy within cultures and societies. In sum, the workings of race are a clear example of the demonic in our midst. The argument that I've been making is that the theological category of the, the demonic, as explicated by Tillich, is uniquely helpful in the work of interrogating the category of race. Till now, I've simply identified the similarities between the workings of the two. Here, let me be explicit about the end to which this comparison is made. I begin with the observation that most critical race theorists and others who think about race proceed with their work with the seeming assumption that when the workings of race are unmasked, it will lose its power to continually reinscribe its scion, racism, on every new historical moment. So in other words, once we get it figured out and stop talking about it, then there won't be any more racism. This approach, which presumes race to be a problem of epistemology, a fictive and false knowledge, is continually finding itself searching for new languages and discourses to interrogate and expose the fallacy of race as, as it is reinscribing itself in the contemporary moment. A consequence of this is that critical race theorists are frequently left to the engagement with racism as an artifact left by a particular ideological formulation which has moved on to be something else. So we're theorizing about what race was and it's become something entirely different. Here I raise the question, how might this situation change if race were interpreted not as a category of false knowledge, but rather as a profound encounter with the holy and thus a religious faith. Now the first contribution I want to suggest that such a framing of this as a theological issue can make to understanding race is that of reframing the matter as something deeper than epistemological error. What this intervention turns on is the idea that the category of race, by its very nature, seeks to make sense of the existential dilemmas of atomization and alienation, which are attendant to human life in modernity. It does this by the creation of fictive histories and destinies into which we might be drawn to find new meaning for our individual existence. We are drawn into something much larger and significantly more profound than any individual experience of life can be. Is this not precisely the dynamic dactylic gesture toward in his account of what it means to be grasped by the ultimate concern? Is this, it is this dimension of the working of race to which I pointed in describing it as a religious discourse. As a religious discourse, race then creates possibilities for the investment of the whole self 
into narrations of consciousness and being which creates grounds of existence which are immediately life-giving in their creation of sites of unity for our existence. I qualify life-giving because as we proceed it will become clear that these sites of unity are anything but. I would argue that this dimension of the category of race helps to explain the power of fascination that it exists across time and context. So as often as we demonstrate that race is a fiction, we continue to live as if it is something real. A second contribution uh, is closely related to the first. Theological discourse Theological discourses are uniquely situated to explore the nature and workings of symbols as they invite persons to the dissolution of their selves into a larger transcendent site of meaning. Here I have in mind Tillich's identification of the third characteristic of a symbol, namely the power of symbols to open levels of reality which are otherwise closed to us. These levels of reality have finally to do what with the ultimate. What I'm suggesting here is that theological discourses can make sense not only of the symbolization of flesh but more importantly how these symbolizations shape the religious imagination and all race is is a symbolization of flesh. This shaping of the religious imagination results in the deployment of features of finitude as being definitive of the holy. A simple example of this appropriate to our exploration is the continuing religious cultural battles in North America about the race of Jesus. Routinely these battles bring to the fore a level of resistance to racial ambiguity or a shifting racial identification of Jesus so deep as to suggest that the very question of the race of Jesus has salvific consequence. I would suggest that the resistance is born to a deep sense that a profanation of the holy is taking place. What can explain investments in a category of finitude of such depth that they ensnare the ultimate symbol of a religious faith? The simple answer is that in this context a category of finitude race has inscribed itself onto the holy and thus contestation over it becomes a matter of faith and not simply aesthetics. A more complex answer would explore the ways that the category has come to have um, uh, a status of ultimacy. Now the final point I want to make is a culmination of the underlying argument that has run throughout this lecture. The most significant contribution that theology can make to discussions of race is to situate it in the field of vision that I have appropriated from Tillich in relation to the demonic. Clearly this allows for an interpretation of the category of race that is theological by its nature. More importantly though, it allows explorations and interrogations of the workings of race to move beyond materially descriptive to the, to the terrain of the deepest levels of human existence. And here I'm going to pause, and this is what distinguishes my explorations from that of Willie Jennings and of J. Cameron Carter. They're much more interested in talking about how race constructs faith and faith constructs race as categories of, that are part of the, the history of the Christian faith. I'm more interested in trying to find a way to theologically to talk about how the thing works and only secondarily about the history of how it came to be what it is. Now as I've tried to suggest throughout this lecture, the reason that racism as a species of race um, seem such an intractable feature of human existence in, in modernity is because the field of its operation is religious faith. Resort to a discourse immediately connected to uh, questions of the ultimate which 
reflections on the demonic does, then allows an engagement of race on the level of faith and religion, the level that I have argued faith operates on. This is an important corrective to the usual practice of assuming that race or racism somehow corrupts and distorts faith and religion, the underlying assumption being that they can exist apart from this corruption. Additionally, use of the demonic allows us to interpret the workings of race through traditional theological doctrines such as the fall, such as redemption. I mean, and I'm not doing that here, but it allows us to bring those into the conversation. Precisely because the demonic is an inescapable dimension of the human encounter with the holy, reflection on it draws us into other dimensions of human existence that are inescapably mired in alienation and anxiety. At least on my read, this dimension of inevitability is missing from most discourses about race with the result that its effects are always underestimated and reports of its demise greatly exaggerated. This exaggeration accounts for the continuance of this particular absurdity that is race in the quotidian that is our time. Thank you. Okay, so I've tried to leave some time for questions. There were a couple of points I wanted to expand on, but I'd rather talk with you all. So we have time for questions or comments. There was a time when the discourse on race that we practice in this nation was not in place. And uh, so uh, can you imagine the possibility of when that discourse may lose its power from a historical perspective. Mm -hmm. And what could that replace? Uh, knowing that some of your suggestions based on Tillich is about what, what are the, the underlying uh, search in hu human existence is the right for affirmation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, why will that discourse uh, uh, remains valid and attractive and powerful uh, in spite of its finitude? Well, I think uh, it, as a way of answering um, certainly the first part of your question, my uh, 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 sense is that as long as there's something like modernity that exists, which is the world captivated and largely owned by the kind of consciousness and imagination that was constructed during the Enlightenment period in the West. As long as the world is constellated in that way, race will be the category because it was part of the founding of that world. Now, what will replace it? I don't know. And, I mean, and what I mean by that is history teaches us that an analog um, in the Hellenic period would have been right the Hellenic and the barbarian, right? I mean, that would have been an analog, and that existed for hundreds of years. So what will replace race? I don't know. But what I do know is that as long as the world constellates itself around the presumptions of modernity that make the world in which we live, it will continue to be a category that exerts the kind of force that we experience it. Thank you so much, uh, Stephen, for a really brilliant and thought-provoking um, lecture. Um, I, um, the, 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 the takeaway that I have, I have three points of the takeaway. One, that I really appreciate the, the moving structurally rather than historically. I think that, that does a lot of a lot, um, a lot more work than the historical um, genesis, as, as you 
pointed out with, um, with Carter and, and Jennings. Um, I also appreciate the, um, the iconoclasm against the liberal narrative. I really appreciate that. There is no kind of liberal narrative on which we're moving to uh, you know, a better place. I think yeah, working structurally, you've really, really taken that, that on. And I really also appreciate the way you hook up language and reality, because I think discourse analysis without ontology is, is misguided. Um, so I have a few, a few kind of thoughts about, about um, the relationship between this epistemological misplacement, the idolatry side, so what's going on in the, in the mind, and the demonic, because I'm not quite sure how they hook up. At some points in your lecture, you were emphasizing the epistemological misplacement as idolatry, and there Tillich is very much you know, indebted to you know, the, the injunction against, against idolatry. On the other hand, the holy and the demonic, um, I'm kind of like, is this an equivocation? Is the holy the demonic? So, wh so what's going on there? How do you distinguish the holy from the demonic? And then I also think that there's like another element, the schematization that could, could also add to the, um, the, the, the dimension of the demonic. It's, it's the, the cultural symbols that are used uh, aren't, you know, uh, are also misguided. So it, it's the epistemological misplacement of the cultural symbols, the cultural misplace, uh, the cultural symbols that are in and, them, in and of themselves problematic, and then this kind of holy and demonic. So I was, I was wondering if you could kind of address the different, uh, the different pieces. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I can do that. I do so with trepidation because not a lot of you know, but Dr. Helmer was my TA when I was taking uh, systematic theology at Yale. So when, when the, one of the people who helped you teach theology asks you a question, you want to have a good answer. <laughs> well, I, if I had had time, what I would have spent time doing, and I actually would have shown a clip, because the way I think about the relationship between the holy and between uh, the demonic is encapsulated perfectly in Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? In the scene when they're opening the uh, Ark of the Covenant, and there are all of these wisps of, uh, 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 and mist coming out of it. And the one that comes toward the person who is standing in the place of Aaron, first is an angelic face with a smile, but then it quickly becomes a skull. And from that point on, all who are there are destroyed. So what I understand Tillich to be saying, and I think is helpful, is that the power that is the demonic is actually the holy, but improperly approached. So in the same way that throughout narratives of the um, Old Testament, uh, when God is approached inappropriately, it's still the same God, but the consequence is destruction. So that the holy and the demonic, the demonic is what one encounters when one approaches the holy improperly. And the approach improperly is to misplace the identification of the holy, right? To treat something infinitude as if it is the ultimate. Because what ends up happening is that from an existentialist discourse, we are treating it as the holy, but it is something that is not. So that's where the, so it's not so much a Janus uh, kind of thing where it's the two faces of, but it's rather that is the holy is the power of life and the power of destruction always. And depending on how one approaches it, one will either experience it as the creative power of existence or as the destructive power of death. Does that sort of get at us? said some things that um, have me thinking in a strange way. Because you talked about race leading to idolatry and idolatry being a misidentification of the holy. And what popped into my mind was that the church, which frequently in my book misidentifies the holy, is a place that might lead us to idolatry to the worship of idols. <laughs> that's, that's not a good place for me to be. But um, so here's my question. Is the church created by cultia or is cultia 
a creation of faith. Which is it? And which one is the most responsible, if you come up with that answer, for this misidentification of the holy that makes us all idol worshippers? Well, I think a way to approach that would be to say I'm not going to answer because it's both. But, it, but, but there is, there, there is um, 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 uh, an idea that I do want to say because I, I do think it's both. And, and part of what the idea is, is that the church cannot exist apart from culture. Right, I mean, the church expresses itself through culture. The church expresses itself through symbols, right? I mean, this is just the way that, um, and so what ends up happening is that when we come into the church, what the church invites us to do is the church invites us to open ourselves to the workings of the holy. But a part of the problem with human beings is that once we are open to the working of the holy, we're doing so in the presence of all of these culturally mediated symbols. And because we've opened ourselves at the deepest levels of our being, and it's in the presence of these culturally mediated symbols, what ends up happening is that the capacity for us to mistake those symbols for that which we are seeking to open ourselves fully is, is, is tremendous. And, that's, and so what it means then is that um, there's no expression of um, the church or of the faith without culture, but precisely because of what it means to be finite creatures, we will more often than not mistake those cultural mediations for that which it is that they are trying to mediate. Probably call a halt here, but please let's thank Dr. Ray for his lecture. Thank you.